The time is 10 o'clock. Good morning to everyone on this uh, video teleconference. Welcome to today's meeting. I will now call the regular meeting of the Louisville Metro Light Pollution C Control Board to order. Due to the COVID-19 outbreak, we are conducting the monthly September board meeting today by video teleconference. I will now conduct a roll call of board members that are present on this teleconference. When I call your name, please say I'm here. Steve Sullivan. Dr. Colbert. Dr. May. I see her. Yep. Uh, Candace White. Don't forget to and, unmute before replying. Uh, am I, um, let me see. Can you hear me, Carl? Yes, I can. Okay. I see, yeah, doctor, I can hear you. Um, and Heather Allen, I see her. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, board members, uh, for your attendance uh, this morning. Uh, Mr. Talley, do we have any introductions this morning? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Hampton, any uh, public recognitions? For Mr. Or Mr. Talley, any public recognitions uh, this morning? No public recognitions this morning. Okay. Um, now we are uh, at the approval minutes. Uh, the minutes are the... Um, public hearing held on August 19th, 2020, were distributed electronically for your review. Are there any changes to the minutes by the board members regarding the public hearing minutes? Hearing none, the minutes of the public uh, hearing minutes are approved. The minutes of the regular board meeting held on August 19th, 2020, were distributed electronically for your review. Are there any change to the regular board uh, minutes by board members? None. Hearing none, the minutes of the regular board meeting are approved. Public comment. Mrs. Hampton, has anyone from the public registered to make a comment? No, sir. I've not had anyone register this morning. Okay, thank you. One from the public provided written comments. No, sir. No, thank you. Are there any other uh, members of the public that wish to make a brief comment on this teleconference? Please raise your hand by teleconference. This is a feature you can find on the bottom of your screen or by pressing star three. If joining by phone, and you will, will be called up on. Mrs. Hampton, have you recognized anyone wishing to speak? No, sir, I don't see any raised hands this morning. Okay. Well, that completes the uh, public comment portion of the meeting. Uh, moving on to unfinished business. Um, there is no unfinished business. New business, there is no new business. Um, committee reports, uh, no committees met. Uh, staff reports, um, we have the uh, director's report, Mr. Talley. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Hilton. Good morning, Chairman Hilton, board members. Uh, I trust everyone is remaining diligent in their COVID protocols and staying safe. Uh, Chairman Hilton, as part of today's director's report, I would like to have Assistant Director Hamilton provide a report uh, providing some additional points and perspectives about the work that we do. Uh, in fact, uh, with the board's approval, I would like to make the presentations from APCD's department managers and in, in some cases from supervisors and other APC, APCD staff a regular part of the director's report uh, as appropriate. Uh, there is a wealth of experience 
experience and expertise that we can bring to the board's attention. And there is no reason that I should act as a middleman for these presentations and discussions when we have subject matter experts uh, that can really do a, a much better job. So Chairman Hilton, board members, uh, do you think this would be something of benefit and value to the board during the monthly board meetings? Dr. May? I would appreciate it. Heather? Yes, I finally figured out how to unmute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dr. Colbert? Uh, uh, Candace White? Up. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. I think that's uh, appropriate. Uh, it seems like most of the, uh, the board members uh, would um, uh, have agreed that that would be a great uh, way to uh, move forward, uh, uh, Mr. Talley, yes. Could you repeat that? I, I wasn't brought in when you guys were talking earlier. Well, uh, Mr. Talley asked, uh, no, he made a comment to the board members that he would like to have some of his subordinates, uh, supervisors, and managers to also make presentations uh, uh, during the uh, board meetings instead of him doing all the talking. I guess, in essence, that's what he was saying. Okay. You agree with that? Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Taylor, that's, that's great. I think uh, moving forward, uh, we, we would look uh, forward uh, to that, the board members would. You know, that, that's outstanding. Uh, again, we just have so many folks with so much experience and so much expertise. Uh, I just think it would be beneficial to have them uh, interact directly with the board so that you can ask them questions. Uh, and in a lot of respects, uh, they'll just simply do a better job than I can do uh, handing some, uh, providing some of this information uh, through me as a, as a middleman. So uh, we will work on that as appropriate. We'll bring folks uh, uh, to the table to, to make those presentations. And again, this morning, uh, following my remarks, uh, we'll have uh, Assistant Director Hamilton bring some of her perspectives about the work that, that we do. Okay. Uh, uh, continuing, as always, I like to make sure the board is aware of any media reports that are out in the public domain. Um, to that end, last month, I provided an interview uh, to WHAS. It ended up as a two-part article. The first was entitled, Louisville's Air Quality, has improved, but work is still needed. It highlighted uh, our, our redesignation to attainment from the partial SO2 non-attainment the city had been under for several years. Additionally, it touched on the overall air quality improvement that the city has seen, and then highlighted the city's ongoing challenges to meet the new, more stringent ozone standard. The second article was entitled, Louisville Hopes to Get Ozone Under Better Control. This was part two of his series, and it focused on the concerns and challenges that ozone pollution presents. Uh, Dr. Aruni Bahatnagar, director of the University of Louisville Environment Institute noted, and rightly so, that traffic and geography are a major contributors to our ozone problem. The article also pointed out that Overall improvement in air quality and the increase in the number of good air quality days uh, in our community. As noted in the article, despite these improvements, current pollution levels still pose health risk in our community. I will also point out that Shannon Baker of the American Lung Association stated, and I quote, while governments continue to work to improve our air, community efforts also help. She went on to say, we can make a better difference by our daily choices. When I have to idle my car in line, do I turn off the ignition or do I choose to idle? The answer is roll the windows down and turn off the ignition when you can. You know, this is important messaging coming from other sectors of our community that share our concern and desire to improve air quality. So if any board members did not see these articles, let, let us know and we can forward the links uh, to you for your review. I also conducted an interview with WFPL. It was in regards to the construction permit application for advanced ready mix, a cement plant in Butchertown neighborhood, and the community's request for a public hearing regarding that permit. I think as outlined in the email to the board from Assistant Director Hamilton on yesterday, advanced ready mix withdrew their application. Therefore, the district's plan to conduct a public hearing has been canceled. To my knowledge, an article from that interview has not yet been posted. 
if we see it, we will make sure that we get that out uh, to the board members. Okay. On August 20th, the district conducted a public meeting on the advance notice of proposed rulemaking or the RMP or risk management program. Uh, the meeting was moderately attended and to date we have only received about four comments, three of which were from industry. We have met internally, discussed ways to garner more community participation, targeting known community advocacy groups, metro agencies such as the Office of Equity and the University of Louisville Environment Institute. And I make a request to you, uh, the board, uh, as these meetings and opportunities to, to participate and have input in this discussion, uh, if you can get the word out, let folks know that this is out there, uh, that we're looking for input and comments from the community uh, that will help us in, in moving this along. APCD staff continue to take advantage of online webinar-based training and learning opportunities. Most recently, we have continued the webinar series provided by Marama, the Mid-Atlantic Regional and Air Management Association. The latest session was on ozone controls. Additionally, some staff also participated in the EPA-sponsored ASTM, the American Society for Testing and Materials, presentation on air sampling, multidimensional gas chromatography, and synthetic, and synthetic odor man, uh, match technology. And this is all to get, a, a, get at the difficult and subjective issue of odor compliance. And so my point is, uh, we continue to look for ways during the pandemic while we're still all working at home uh, to continue to, to learn and grow and, and uh, uh, continue the work that we do. The district continues to work with MSD through biweekly meetings as they develop compliance plans to address their NOV. The work continues to move forward and the current plan is to have them present before this board at the October board meeting. We want to give them the opportunity to bring you up to date as to their plans and addressing that NOV and then to allow you to ask questions, voice concerns, and make comments. And so uh, again, we, uh, the current plan is to have that presentation at the October board meeting. Uh, I hope everyone can make it. It will be great information. I think they've done some good work so far. Uh, and so we need to get that out there in the public domain, make sure that the board is aware of it to address the NOV that they approved. On uh, August 9th, Michelle King, Byron Gary provided an update to GLI, Greater Louisville uh, Inc bringing them up to date on the multi-pollutant stakeholder group process and then addressing any questions that they had. You know, I was able to listen in even though I wasn't directly involved in the presentation and not so objectively, I have to tell the board that as you might expect, uh, Michelle and Byron did an outstanding job. Uh, I think they provided the information that uh, the industry members at GLI needed to hear. There were not a lot of questions, but I think that the reason there weren't a lot of questions is because the presentation did a good job of bringing them up to speed and addressing uh, issues that might be of concern to them. On last week, Rachel, Michelle, and I met with OMB leadership and staff. As I have mentioned previously, APCD has been fortunate in terms of major budget impacts related to both the pension issue and the COVID crisis. Some metro agencies have been, uh, have been less fortunate uh, have had substantial financial impacts. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a brief update as to the contents of that meeting. So OMB was able to provide a review of our fiscal year 20 operations. And then additionally, uh, they provided a discussion of the fiscal 21 budget implementation that we'll be undergoing for, for the next fiscal year. Uh, we really wanna keep an open and transparent communications with our Metro partners so that we can work more effectively and efficiently together. We had several issues that we wanted to bring to their attention and at least get the discussion started and, and, and our perspective uh, on the table. Uh, the first thing that we did, we wanted to give them a heads up regarding our source of funding from Kentucky Transportation Funds. Uh, part of those funds are used to fund our CARE program. The other portion of that funding comes from Indiana and Kentucky has changed uh, uh, how those funds and, and where they're coming from within the state. And we wanted to make sure OMB was aware of that change so they could be prepared to receive those funds. Uh, we also, uh, based on the fiscal 20 uh, 
presentation they gave and the fiscal 21 uh, implementation plan that they provided, uh, we requested a, a deeper review of, uh, of both of those. We wanted to take a look at and make sure the current budget accounts and cost centers uh, to make sure that they are set up appropriately uh, for the coming year. And particularly, we wanted uh, to make sure that accounts with balances that roll over from year to year are accurate and that the newly uh, renewed EPA 103 grant uh, has been uh, appropriately broken out uh, into the appropriate cost centers for personnel, equipment, supplies, et cetera. And, I, and all of this is so that we can better track the fiscal position of that grant throughout the year. Uh, and so really just a little bit of housekeeping uh, going on just to make it easier for us to uh, make sure that we're on track, that uh, we uh, don't find ourselves in a position where uh, we're not quite sure what's going on. And I think the changes that we're discussing and, and planning on to dis discussing uh, will help us do that. Uh, we were also able at, at this meeting to confirm the financial status of the new Cannons Lane lease uh, for the monitoring site uh, at that location. Uh, for our new board members, that's the old vet center at Bowman Field. And in that update, uh, the, what we understand now is that the actual lease is in the signature change, uh, chain. Uh, all parties have agreed to the contents of that, and so we're waiting for the final signatures, and that the lease payments for this will be run through uh, facilities. And so again, just want to make sure all of us, including OMB, are on the same page. And just a little history. Originally, uh, that site had been paid for by a grant that ran, uh, that made that lease payment and covered 15 years. So for 15 years, that had been prepaid, we weren't making payments. So um, it took a little while for us to get everybody on the same page to get this lease finalized, but I, I think we're uh, rounding the turn and uh, we will have that signed and updated uh, here in short order. Uh, I will keep the board up to date if there are any changes, but I expect that this will uh, move forward appropriately and we will put this one to bed uh, and move on. And then lastly, uh, we had a discussion with, with OMB and we, we just want to be clear moving forward, uh, on, especially in these uncertain times, uh, about certain things that we need to know in terms of our planning. So we had a discussion about, one, our ability to fund current staffing needs. Uh, we have several uh, postings out there, several postings that are in the works, and so we are moving forward with filling vacant positions. Uh, we also wanted to talk about the need uh, to address retention and sal salary equity issue concerns uh, within the district. And so we uh, had that discussion with them. We just wanted to put that on the table uh, as we work our, uh, work, put our plan together uh, to try to address some of those needs, even under some of these tough fiscal uh, uh, environment that we find ourselves in. And then finally, uh, we, we talked to them about the possibility for expansion opportunities, even under these current economic conditions. Uh, strategically, uh, even under these conditions, we still have to plan to do the work of the district and, and our work is dynamic. It changes when regulations change. change. Uh, our work changes uh, uh, as the needs of our community change. And so we need to be in a position to try to address those changes. Uh, and that will require us to strategically plan for that. And so I really just wanted to make them aware that uh, even under these conditions, we will still be moving forward strategically, planning for those things that we think the district needs to do in, uh, in, in the future uh, to address the, the issues that exist in our community from an air quality standpoint. And, and even though uh, Daniel Frock, uh, the director of OMB, indicated, you know, these are really tough times, he did uh, – uh, state that it would be prudent for us to uh, continue to make those plans, to put them on the table, uh, and we will have to just see how our, our fiscal situation changes, what kind of shape we're in uh, at, at the appropriate time. Uh, so we will be prepared as an agency to to at least uh, make those requests for doing those things that we we need to, we'll need to do going forward. As I have uh, discussed over the last several board meetings, efforts across Metro are ramping up to address social equity, and in our case, environmental justice issues. Uh, Rachel, Michelle, and I met with staff from Develop Louisville, including planning and zoning, to discuss, to discuss the land development code reform, uh, and, and that in terms of it being rel uh, relative to the environmental justice concerns that, that, that we have. Um, 
Uh, that group with uh, Develop Move are currently doing some background research, so looking at best practices from across the country, and then analyzing the impacts that, frankly, the bad policy uh, that we've had for years has had on our community. Uh, they are trying to prioritize uh, where the most impact has occurred, and then strategizing uh, about what can be done in the short term to address those issues immediately, uh, and then what policy changes and land uh, development code reforms um, need to be put in place to prevent it from happening in the future. You know, I have to tell the board we are, are incredibly excited about this work and then all of the work that's going on across uh, Metro. Uh, it is very collaborative, which it needs to be. It is very comprehensive, as it needs to be. And as uh, we have mentioned often, APCD cannot address environmental justice issues uh, in our community in a vacuum. We will need to work with other agencies across Metro to produce the type of comprehensive results that will have real and lasting impact. And so I look forward on updating the board on this work over uh, the coming year. In fact, um, Louisville, Louisville Development folks uh, hope to be able to share the recommendations for the code reform as early as January uh, 21. So uh, they got a lot of work to do, and they are planning to do it in a, in a very short period of time. Uh, we will stay in contact uh, with them, uh, provide input where we can and where appropriate, uh, to address environmental justice issues uh, that are impacted by uh, the land development code issues. And so, uh, again, we have mentioned this on, on several occasions, uh, the need for uh, the community to have the opportunity to, to look at uh, development and programs on the front end. Uh, it is generally, and in a lot of cases, too late to try to, for, to have the community have meaningful input by the time those decisions reach uh, the permitting stage with APCD, and so we are hoping that some of the reforms that are are in the, in in the works and that are being discussed uh, will help alleviate some of that and provide community the opportunity uh, to direct to address what's going to happen in their community on the front end as opposed to the middle of that process. And then, lastly, at least for me, uh, in this director's report. Uh, appropriate staff participated in required ethics, ethics training on Monday. Uh, new staff were required to have that training within their first 12 months of employment, uh, and then all other staff are required uh, to update their training at least every 24 months. So at least from an ethical standpoint, uh, I hope we won't get you into any trouble over the next two, two years, and uh, just wanted to make you aware that Metro is serious about uh, those issues and making sure that, that we are aware of the uh, the rules and the regulations governing uh, ethics as we work for Metro government. Uh, if there are no questions for me from the board, uh, which I'd be happy to take, I uh, will turn the next portion of the director's report over to Rachel. Uh, are there any questions for me at this point? Any questions from the board members? No. Nope. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Talley, for a well uh, detailed report. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome, sir. Uh, Rachel, I will turn the reins over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Talley. Good morning, board members. It is a pleasure to be with you this morning. And I wanted to let you know that Steve came to me a couple of days ago and, and asked me to say a few words about the work of the district's operation. And this is a presentation that uh, I've given to the board a number of times. It's one that the district has covered in great detail in a fabulous presentation available on our website through the APCD Clearing the House Workshop Series. That's our APCD 101. In trying to think about why Keith asked uh, me to give this presentation, uh, it's my realization that with COVID, we're going to be teleworking uh, for a little bit longer and perhaps longer than I anticipated. It is challenging for us to do the collaborative type of work that we do at APCD through telework. We have to try harder, but our work is collaborative. We all rely on each other and our own work to continue to do the good work that's been done through the 50 years of the Clean Air Act and before that through the board's own work. So I thought I'd take a little different tack here today and just put it into a, a historical perspective to add some context to the work that we're going to have to do going forward. So 
I draw your attention to the picture here on this first slide. That's all that you're going to see here are a couple of pictures of slides of the good old days. These are taken from a article that was written by uh, Art Williams, former director of APCB, and Barry Zalf, technical coordinator for the district in 2002. There is a link to the article in Sustain Magazine, which is part of the Kentucky Institute for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Louisville at the end of my presentation. And I really invite you to take a look at this article. And the one that follows, it talks about air toxics. Uh, we have a lot of work going forward, and as I said, we are going to have to do this work together, as we always have. That very first picture there is a picture of a trolley, and it's coming at you in the middle of the day. But because of the smog and fog in the photo, you'll see that its headlights are on. This is from 1948. In 1947, or I'm sorry, 1945, the Board of Aldermen authorized the Louisville Smoke Commission. That's the predecessor of our board. So this is where you all began. In 1948, we had a killer fog in Denora, Pennsylvania, and in 1952, a similar event in London, England. From that, as a federal proposition, the very first Clean Air Act was actually passed by Congress in 1955 didn't do much, but what it did was start the foundation of what we're working with today. In particular, it appropriated money and it required public health agencies, including the Surgeon General and the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, to begin developing research so that they could recommend methods for eliminating or reducing pollution. And you'll have to understand at the time, Congress doesn't have the authority to legislate for the general welfare just as a, as a normal proposition. They have to have some sort of a legislative hook. And the legislative hook that they decided on was that they could see by that time that air pollution was causing an impact on crops and damage to property and creating hazards to ground and air transportation. So they used the Commerce Clause as their way of saying, we as a country are going to have to start working on this issue and it's a national issue. Andy, if you'll go to that next slide. These are some very early pictures of what the district was doing in the 1950s. This is just a lab facility. You will hear uh, from some of our folks in our air monitoring section about our air monitoring today. In fact, uh, Tom Lobb and Billy DeWitt are working with uh, Metro TV to put together a virtual tour of our air monitoring site and to help explain how we know when we set up an air monitoring site that we're getting results that help us from a public health standpoint and a regulatory standpoint manage Louisville's air quality. Next slide, Bill, from Andy. I'm in awe of these pictures. We no, no longer have a, an air pollution balloon, but it's back in the day we did. You have to remember, this was back during that great UFO craze, and I can kind of see looking at these photos uh, how folks might have seen some of our work as rather uh, cutting edge and a little freaky. Next slide. Part of that 1955 Clean Air Act required uh, Congress to fund special projects looking at air quality, and APCB has always been a leader. And in 1956 and 1957, a special study looking at air pollution in Louisville was conducted as part of that 1955 Act. One of the important things for us to remember here is that in 1952, the General Assembly authorized the creation of air pollution control districts. And by 1955, Louisville had the only and still has the only air pollution control district in Kentucky. That study was groundbreaking. It actually uses many of the same methods that we use today. Canisters, analysis of those canisters, reporting of that data. It didn't have the same structure, though, in terms of making regulatory changes that we enjoy today. In fact, in 1963, 
Congress came back, looked at their original Clean Air Act and said, well, that was a good start. Now we know a little bit more. We're going to need to do something different here. And at that point, they really got together and they emphasized information gathering, financial assistance, and some abatement measures. Uh, for those of us who've worked with the Control Technology Guidelines, or CTG, uh, which lay out the um, RACT, or Reasonably Available Control Technology, that's really the genesis of those Control Technology Guidelines. Congress focused air pollution as a idea coming from people, stationary sources, and mobile sources. And they really stressed that that's the place where we were going to have to work to make reductions. Um, they established an enforceable framework that really focused on interstate air pollution, but they left intrastate the state and local agencies. Having a state or local agency focusing on air pollution at this time is not a, a feature of the Clean Air Act yet. But it really is important to acknowledge that a lot of groundwork was laid by agencies like APTD using common law nuisance, public nuisances, private nuisances, to begin to reduce pollution at that local level. Unfortunately, um, focusing as they did on interstate pollution didn't really allow them to make a lot of changes to air pollution limits. So APCD had a lot of rules at that time. They were simple. Just from stacks at the time were capped at 850 parts per million. That's a pretty thick plume for those of us who uh, now work in parts per billion. Vehicle and other stack emissions were limited by their opacity. And we had no control or monitoring of gaseous pollutants like sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, or even carbon monoxide. Andy, if you'll go to the next slide. We also didn't have, at the time, any regulations around greenhouse gas or other air toxics. This article, I'm not sure if you can read it at the bottom, is actually from the Louisville Times in 1958. Air pollution may melt polar ice caps. It's just stunning to me that that's an issue that has been around as long as my husband's been alive. So, how did we get to where we are today? In 1970, what we really see is the modern Clean Air Act that we work with today. It did some really fundamental things. It formed the EPA by taking powers from the Department of Agriculture and Health education and welfare. It required states to develop departments of environmental quality, including our counterparts at the, Depart at the Energy and Environmental Cabinet in Frankfurt and the Division for Air Quality. Wisely, the General Assembly allowed APCD to continue to be more stringent where appropriate. The original Clean Air Act of 1970 established the National Ambient Air Quality Standard that we work with today on those criteria pollutants for sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, particulate matter, lead, ozone, nitrogen oxide. In 1975, APCD operated eight monitors for um, the area. Carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, ozone, those were all challenges and great challenges at the time. We issued permits, they were very simple. We were beginning to develop uh, additional regulatory programs. But in 1977, Congress stepped back in and recognized that they needed to be thoughtful about how EPA would proceed. And so they required EPA to review every five years those national ambient air quality standards to be sure that they remained protective of public health and the environment. 
And so we, we see how the Commerce Clause has moved from protecting crops and property into the Endangerment Clause that EPA now uses to evaluate action at that federal level. That five-year plan is something that just amazes me. It's the continuous improvement part of the Clean Air Act. That's what we're facing today with our ozone challenge. Our air has gotten cleaner. Our standard has gotten stronger. We have work to do. And you'll be hearing from folks that the agency works to go through uh, the process that's laid out in the Clean Air Act to bring our area back into attainment. After 1977, the district had additional regulatory programs that came into play. The Vehicle Emissions Testing Program in 1984, Gasoline Vapor Recovery in 1994, Reformulated Gas in 1995. In 1990, Congress again came back to the Clean Air Act and they strengthened it yet again. They added in the Title V program so that very large sources were required to have additional record keeping, reporting, and monitoring and that information was intended to be put in a place where the public could access it to provide greater transparency as sources were controlling their emissions. They also put in place a plan for air toxics. Along the way, APCD took some additional steps, and that includes you know, looking at air toxics. That really started in the late 1990s. Keith is right. There are many of us at the agency who uh, went to college and chose to do this for a profession. Some folks, like Keith, have looked into being able to do this work. It is a privilege to help clean the air. It's also a very weighty responsibility. It takes all of my colleagues working together as a team for us to be able to do this work, and they are amazing. I'm going to leave you with this thought from the authors of the article that I mentioned. As they looked back over the district's past, present, and thought about its future, they actually thought about what Louisville's air quality would be in 2020. And here are their thoughts. With continued public support, elected officials will continue to work to improve environmental quality. Environmental, non-governmental organizations, businesses, and private individuals will collaborate with government agencies to define necessary standards of environmental quality and find ways to meet those standards. By 2020, the current criteria air pollutants will probably have minimal significance, particularly if acid deposition and haze have declined to acceptable levels. Air toxics, perhaps with some important modifications to the current list, will probably require ongoing scrutiny and reduction. Greenhouse gases may pose the most urgent challenge. Given the complexities of atmospheric chemistry and epidemiology, the science and practice of air pollution control will evolve for decades to come. Some current practices will prove highly effective. Others will probably prove less so due to gaps in current understanding. Improvements from 1970 to 2001 provide hope that pollution control efforts to date have moved in the direction of improving public health and protecting natural resources while preserving economic vitality. That's a really amazing view into the future from our colleagues in the past. Friends and colleagues, as we look forward, we all know there's always work to be done in this unprecedented time as we face twin public health crises including COVID-19 and racism, both of which have time to air quality and our work. We are going to need to work together collaboratively, respectfully, thoughtfully as coworkers, community members, and board members. COVID-19 truly has made our work more difficult and challenging. 
but now more than ever, we're all going to have to work in our professional capacity to see that our legacy, when the APCD is 2040, look back on our work to see what we've accomplished. I thank Keith for inviting me to give some comments, and I look forward, as he does, to hearing from the folks who do this work to share what we're doing today, including the Strategic Toxic Air Reduction Program, which in 2002 was not mentioned in the article, even though the agency was conducting the West Louisville Air Toxic Study. In the coming weeks and months, as the board, as the community, and as we as an agency look at our work, we'll have questions. We invite those. At this point in time, uh, Andy, if you'll hit the last slide, you can find the article that I've referenced here at this link. And again, for my APCD colleagues in particular, this is a great article to take a look at. Think about our work and also the work that you want to accomplish. And with that, Mr. Chairman, are there any questions? No, uh, Rachel, uh, Ms. Hampton, that, that was a very good uh, historical perspective. Um, just one uh, quick question of the, um, the Clean Air Act of 1990. That is the act that required companies to have a Title V uh, permit. Is that, is is that correct. more far rich? Yeah. So most companies had to uh, submit a Title V within what, five years or whatever? So the Clean Air Act of 1990 set in place that Title V requirement for the largest of our sources. It is a regulatory program that took some time to develop. Uh, the district had its program authorized by US EPA, I believe, in 1998. And as a result, we began writing those Title V permits thereafter. Okay. Uh, we've had upwards as, uh, as many Title V sources as 40 plus sources. I think we're currently down around 37 uh, or so, and we'll provide more information about that. But that's a fundamental uh, shift in how the nation looks at sources. It is a collaborative process with US EPA oversight in terms of being sure that Permits contain adequate record keeping, monitoring, and reporting to demonstrate compliance with those standards. And I would provide pictures and perhaps later, uh, it's a little bit harder with COVID uh, to have a little show and tell, but in the past, the district has regulated sources as complex as those in Rubbertown with a single sheet of paper uh, per process. Very simple. And today we have permits that run upwards of several hundred pages uh, of quite complex information regarding standards and those record keeping, reporting, and monitoring provisions that help us assure that a company is meeting that standard. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions or comments from uh, any of the uh, board members? Uh, yeah, I, I just have a comment I'll add also <clears throat> that a, another landmark provision of the 1990 Clean Air Act was acid rain control. Uh, and that program has been very successful and has really allowed us as a nation to reduce uh, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide emissions. It also serves as a lesson for us all on, on uh, the success of these programs, even though they cost a lot uh, in uh, to apply to climate change. The other interesting thing about the 1990 Clean Air Act is that's the last major revision of the Clean Air Act. So you think about it, oh. you know, it was the early Clean Air Act in 1970, 1977, 1990, major revisions were were occurring not, not quite on every five years as originally envisioned, but fairly regularly. And, now, none since uh, 1990 for uh, oh, years. I, I guess that's probably mostly political because of the political uh, climate. Uh, it, it would really have been helpful if the Congress 
uh, could have passed a revision and included um, as, as law uh, provisions for uh, controlling the climate. Even though exactly. some things were done in the Obama administration, <laughs> as we've seen, they're just not as uh, uh, strong and robust as having that as law in the Clean Air Act. Uh, mm -hmm. But Clean Air Act is really a great thing. We're we're so lucky uh, <clears throat> to have that. That's just, Thank just you. my thoughts. Any other uh, comments from any board members? Hearing none, uh, Ms. Hamilton, thank you for a very uh, detailed historical perspective of the air pollution control regulations and so forth. Uh, I wasn't, uh, I guess I was quite surprised, you know, all the um, uh, revisions to the Clean Air, Act, Clean Air Act, and we haven't had one since 1990. And I agree with uh, Dr. Kobe, we need to uh, really address uh, uh, climate change. Uh, something's going on, I mean, with all these wildfires and hurricanes and stuff. So hopefully we can wake up our politicians to uh, realize that uh, this is real. But uh, again, thank you. It's very, uh, very good. Um, does that uh, conclude your uh, report? Uh, uh, Mr. Talley? Uh, yes, it does. And again, I just want to thank Rachel. I think she did a great job of kind of setting the stage for the, the work that we want to do going forward and the information we want to bring forward. And in fact, the issue of, of climate change uh, and sustainability is one that is on our agenda going forward to bring in some of our folks at the uh, 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 Office of Sustainability and Metro Government to come in and, and, and talk a little bit about what um, Metro Government is doing in that regard. And so that's on the agenda. We will be bringing some of that information forward for, for the board in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, let's move on uh, to the air quality data. Uh, most of you have received the uh, reports. Are there any questions uh, regarding the air quality data uh, report? Uh, also, the enforcement status report. Any questions regarding the enforcement status report? I have a real quick question <clears throat> on that uh, uh, re report. Um, there's some acronyms in there. Maybe not all the board members uh, understand. Like RTO, regenerative, stands for regenerative thermal oxidizer for controlling VOCs. One I don't understand. Uh, I don't know what that means. Is SVR? There was one in there where the the SVR unit uh, went down or something. I, I'd like to know what that is. If someone could explain it. Anybody? Rachel. Rachel. I'm sorry. I was a little distracted. I apologize, sir. Well, that's Could okay. You I, I, the question? Yeah, on the enforcement report, uh, I, I think it's maybe one of the last ones. There's uh, the explanation for the incident was the SVR unit stopped stopped working or something like that. Uh, let me see, let me bring it up. Um, RTO, RTO. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm not finding it now, but somewhere there it says that, that there was an SVR unit that wasn't working. You know, went down. Andy, could you kindly bump Steve Gravett up to a panelist? He's there. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Coburn, that's on the uh, excess emission report. It was a report. It wasn't on the enforcement report. It excess came in. emission report. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. It came in from Eckert, 
Um, they mm -hmm. have a one main control device. It's a large condenser, but they refer to it as the solvent vapor recovery system. So oh. SVR was their solvent vapor recovery system. Okay. So oh, they okay. use a that plant uses a control strategy for their entire plant to bring everything in through that one condenser and recover the solvent for reuse in their process. So when that goes down, it's a major issue for them, but you know, they normally get back on it pretty quickly and bring everything down accordingly. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions regarding the either the uh, enforcement status report or access emission report? Uh, moving on to the uh, complaint investigation status report, I did notice that we had 13 burn uh, complaints in the month of August. Why so many? Have we seen that many uh, burn com uh, complaints in August? <laughs> I know it's been dry. <laughs> That's a lot for the month of August, 13. Um, I would just speculate that there's a lot of people sitting around looking out their backyard, you know, or sitting out in their backyard doing things they normally wouldn't be doing right now. But, you know, it is an uptick, it's, but we do have them throughout the year. So, Okay. And, and most of them are closed. I guess uh, you either uh, uh, go and have a site inspection or issue uh, some type of warning letter. I guess the general public, they're just not aware of the uh, open burning um, regulations in Jefferson County. Probably that's the biggest thing, probably. Yeah, we try to talk to both the person having the fire and the people that called in You know, with our results. We, we call people back, but uh, some fires are legal, some fires aren't, and we tell people to clean them up and give them a chance to come back into compliance. Uh, we also issue warning letters for people that are, you know, we can't get in touch with that do have some issues and we'll do a follow-up inspection. And we have been doing notices of violation for a few cases that haven't responded. Okay, thank you. Very good. Any other uh, questions on any of these other reports from board members? I had, yeah. Um, some of these uh, we may have addressed before, but just as generalities, um, when a complaint is made and a, a person from the organization goes out to check, what is that uh, turnaround time to go see whether or not that odor is still present or the burning is still present? Uh, second question is, um, when a problem is referred to MSD, I know that they take over, but um, does MSD get back in touch with the complainant um, as well? Because there was one complaint where it was like a second um, and it was added on to an ongoing investigation. So I didn't know whether or not the complainant was uh, made aware and, and whether they update APCD. So that way, if a third person was to call, we can say, Yes, there's already been two complaints on that and uh, MSD is investigating that. So we can just say instead of taking their information that they actually already get some feedback. And then, um, so, um, oh, you can answer those questions first. There was another question I had about the complaints, but um, I'll have to think about it. So on the on your first question, the uh, how we were, you know, how fast we turn around. Normally during the day, we can get out there pretty quickly within an hour or so. Uh, we can't always do that. It kind of we have to kind of rank priorities. You know, we've got three compliance officers at the moment that are doing field work. Uh, if it's nights or, or weekends, we'll try to get out there. You know, the first thing the next day. But we know odors are fleeting, and that's not always great. Uh, on some cases, we've done after hours surveillance, uh, like earlier this year, the Cedar Creek MSD facility, we were getting lots of complaints about the evening. So we were doing some after hours surveillance when, at the time we were getting complaints. Okay. You want to take the next part, Rachel? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Bain, with respect to your second question in MSD, that is an issue that we are currently asking them to address as part of the notice of violation we issued to them in November of last year. In particular, we feel it is a gap. Uh, when we send a complaint to MSD to not know how they've responded or when they've responded or if it's part of a recurring issue. So that is something that we should see some uh, resolution on, hopefully in presentation with the board in October. Hmm. Okay. Any other uh, questions by board members? Any 
Hearing none, um, I would now adjourn uh, this regular meeting of the board and thank you for your participation. The next board meeting is Wednesday, October the 21st, 2020 at 10 a.m.